When I left off in our last lesson at chapter 7, verse 1, the Israelites had conquered Jericho and were ready to move west into the interior of Canaan. Their first objective was the small outpost at Ai. This name Ai can be pronounced Ai or Ai as I explained in the last lesson. I will opt for Ai as that is the way the locals who live in the region refer to the location. Now open the PowerPoint presentation that accompanies this lesson to the first slide after the introductory one. It is an enhanced satellite view of the region from the Jordan Valley to the hill country of Canaan. I have shown the main north-south and east-west roads, and where those roads cross is the site of ancient Bethel. Northeast of Bethel, about two miles or three kilometers, was the location of Ai. <clears throat> As you might be able to tell from the slide, there is considerable change in elevation between Ai and Jericho. Jericho, as I have mentioned in a previous lesson, is about 850 feet or 259 meters below sea level, whereas the area of Ai is about 2,150 feet or almost 655 meters above sea level. Thus, the difference in the two locations' elevation is almost 3,000 feet or 914 meters. The straight line distance between the two is about 11 miles or 18 kilometers. Of course, you can see it is impossible to take a straight path between the two locations because of the very difficult terrain. Climbing to Ai or the hill country requires a traveler to move through canyons and along ridge lines that makes the journey much longer. Now read verses 2 through 4 of chapter 7. It is the report of the spies who were sent by Joshua to investigate Ai and the surrounding area. In the NRSV, the author uses the word up six times in those three verses. In the Old Testament, the word up literally means to go up in elevation, and that is certainly the case here. Again, this is a small detail that illustrates the author's familiarity with the events, terrain, and geography, and further supports my thesis that this account in Joshua is a first-hand observer. The spies Joshua had sent to Ai urged him not to cause all the people to climb up to Ai, but only send a small contingent, since the people at Ai were few. Joshua heeded their advice, only to have this small force driven back by the few people. Verse 5 reported, As the Israelites fled from the pursuing men of Ai, through the canyons and back towards Jericho, the Israelites lost 36 soldiers and the hearts of the people melted. Now those were the same words used to describe the people of Jericho after they had heard about God's miracles as he led the Israelites from Egypt. Now one might conclude that 36 men was not a terrible loss. However, in my perusal up to this point in the Bible of Israel's encounter with enemies, I cannot find where the Bible reported that they lost a single soldier. Further, there are two more points that these short verses imply. First, Joshua acted without consulting God. And second, the spies told Joshua what to do, not God. Remember, the spies told Joshua it was not necessary to send a whole army, just a few. The remainder of chapter 7 recounts how Joshua went to God, like Moses before him, and complained that the defeated eye would only embolden God's enemies. But God answered Joshua with a very harsh rebuke. He told Joshua the nation of Israel had sinned. Apparently, while pillaging Jericho, Someone had taken prohibited things for their personal use. You may remember that God directed Joshua to find the culprit and burn him and his belongings. Joshua followed God's instructions and discovered that Achan, of the tribe of Judah, was the thief. At Joshua's urging, Achan made a full confession. Here, please take note of Achan's declaration of guilt in verses 20 and 21. Achan stated that when he saw the beautiful things, he coveted them, and he took them. John Davis, in his wonderful commentary on the book of Joshua, 
observed that those three elements are the three steps to sin, that is, seeing, coveting, and taking. Dr. Davis goes on to give two other well-known Bible examples of what he means. Eve saw the fruit, coveted the fruit, and took the fruit in Genesis chapter 3. The second example he gives is when King David saw Bathsheba bathing. David saw her, coveted her, and then took her in 2 Samuel chapter 11. I am reminded of a little song my kids learned in Sunday school. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see what you see. I think there's a lot of truth to that simple ditty. As a result of Aachen's confession, he was stoned to death. He and his lute were subsequently burned, and a pile of stones was put over his body in a place called the Valley of Achor. <clears throat> now that the sin of Aachen had been handled, chapter 8 immediately returned to the unfinished business at I. Joshua and the people had done as God told them by dealing with Israel's sin, and now the Lord directed Joshua to return to Ai, for God had, quote, handed over to Joshua the king at Ai and his, with his people, his city, and his land. That's verse 1 of chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 2 through 10, describe Joshua's plan of how the army was to defeat Ai. Rather than do a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of this battle plan, I want to summarize it for you. Joshua ordered a large group of men to go behind and near Ai and lay in ambush. On the next morning, Joshua and the rest of the army would march to the city. Joshua then predicted the residents of the city of Ai would come out to attack Joshua's army, and Joshua would pretend to flee. Just as when the Israelites first tried to attack Ai, Ai they would flee. Next, Joshua anticipated the people of Ai would pursue the fleeing Israelites, and when they did, and all the army of Ai had left the city, the ambush push force could come out of hiding, enter Ai, and set it on fire. This was a fine plan, and Joshua immediately sent the large ambush force to get into position. Now please go to the next slide in the PowerPoint presentation. It's titled, The Conquest of Ai. This is an enhanced Google Earth picture of the area where the battle took place. Looking at the picture, I will describe what you see. On the left side of the picture is a city over which I have imposed the word Bethel. The city is modern Ramallah, but under it are the ruins of, I think, ancient Bethel. Just east of the city, you will see three large hills, and to the east of those hills, a valley. This is the valley where the 3,000 men of the ambush force hid. East of the valley is another hill I have labeled Makadar I. This is where I believe I was located, as we discussed in the previous lesson. North of I is another large valley. I have labeled it Valley to the North. <clears throat> I believe it was on the slopes of this valley that Joshua and his army camped. See verse 11, and they camped on the north side of Ai with a ravine between them and Ai. In verse 13, the Bible says Joshua placed a second, smaller force called a rear guard. On the map just northwest of Ai is a line where I suggest the rear guard was positioned. In that place, the rear guard blocked the road from Bethel and prevented any surprises that might come from that city. And finally, at the top of the map, I have labeled the highest mountain in the area because when the battle began, Joshua, or at least one of his assistants, had to be in a place where they could observe the battle and, at the correct time, be able to signal the ambush force. It is possible that Joshua, or one of his assistants, moved to this mountain to observe so the ambush force could be alerted when it was safe to arise and enter the city. That would be done when Ai's defenders had left the city and began to chase the Israelites through the valley to the north, down towards the Jordan Valley. Now keep this picture in front of you. Can you visualize the battle? First the large ambush force took up their position in the valley east of Bethel. The next morning Joshua and his army arrived in the valley to the north and camped on its side. Next Joshua dispatched a blocking force, a rear guard, to prevent being surprised. At the time of attack the next morning, 
the people of Ai left the city to do com- combat with the Israelites, and the Israelites pretended to flee east down the northern valley. Once the people of Ai had left the city, the ambush force was alerted. That's in verses 18 and 19. And the ambush force moved into the city at Ai and set it on fire. As the smoke rose from the burning city, the retreating Israelites saw that as their signal to turn from fleeing and attack the people from Ai. After setting the city on fire, the ambush force then left the city of Ai and moved into the valley to the north. Now Ai's defenders were pinned between the Israelite army and the ambush force in the deep valley. Verse 22 neatly summarized the results. Quote, so they, that is the people at Ai, were surrounded by Israelites, some on one side and some on the other, and Israel struck them down until no one was left who survived or escaped. The next slide is a pictorial summary of the events. I have taken the liberty of putting a picture of a mountain on the slide for illustrative purposes, as well as to show the possible lines of attack and pretended retreat. Take a moment and look at this. The extremely detailed account of the victory at I is a remarkable, especially when placed on a map. How the battle was conducted would be abundantly clear if you were able to travel to Israel and walk the ground with me. But the thorough account in Joshua illustrates the fact that in order for the author to have had such a clear understanding of how military tactics fit perfectly with the geography of the land, he had to be a participant. The next slide is an aerial photograph taken from the north, looking south of the region. The yellow circle con- denotes Kerbet el or where I think ancient Ai is located. The large valley in the center is a canyon, called a wadi in Arabic, in which the ambush force could have hidden. The village in the foreground is modern Betin, the village that Dr. Wood has suggested was Bet Avon, as we discussed in the last lesson. To the right or west of the smoke, on the right side of the photo, is the modern city of Ramallah which is where ancient Bethel was located. Finally, I have drawn on the gray road leading from Beitian a location for where, I be- where I believe the rear guard may have been stationed. That gray road is the ancient road from Bethel to Ai. The two dark black roads seen in the picture are modern and did not exist at the time of Joshua. Verses 23 to 29 conclude the action at Ai and state that Joshua and the army killed the inhabitants of Ai and captured its king. Joshua then hung him, and before sunset, in accordance with the law of Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, to not let a corpse hang all night on a tree, he took the body down and placed it in the gate of the city. The next picture of the PowerPoint presentation shows some of the archaeological evidence found at Makadar or the site where I believe ancient Ai was located. The left photo is of archaeologist Gary Byers sitting behind one of the gate post sockets shortly after he discovered Ai's gate. The photo in the middle is of an upper gate socket found near where the ladies in the photo on the upper right are pointing. They are pointing to the two socket holes where the gate post went into the ground. The photo on the right bottom is of sling stones that were found on the site and in the gate complex. The stones are typical of sling stones from the 15th century BC. In addition to this evidence, walls and layers of burnt ash have been excavated, indicating that the time and manner of destruction is supportive of the biblical date and account. And from all evidence to date, this is the place of Ai, the city that Joshua destroyed. Well, while we are on a discussion of archaeological evidence, I want to point out another intriguing observation. In both the account of Jericho's capture and the victory at Ai, the NRSV and the ESV correctly translate a Hebrew expression that in English says, edge of the sword. See, for example, Joshua 6.21 and 8.24, for examples. However, many other versions, such as the New International Version, do not translate the Hebrew that way and instead replace edge of the sword. 
And they do that with a more generic comment such as destroyed with the sword. This is unfortunate since the Hebrew is very clear and states edge of the sword. The reason I mention this is that edge of the sword refers to the kind of swords used in the 15th century BC, the early date for the exodus and conquest. I explained in an earlier lesson that the preferred metal at this time was bronze. Swords and most other metal implements of war or agriculture were made from bronze, not iron. It wasn't until about the 11th century BC that the metallurgical secret of hardening iron became well known. For example, in 1 Samuel 13, verse 20, at the time of King Saul, between 1050 and 1010 BC, or 400 years after the time of Joshua, the Israelites still did not have the knowledge of how to, ard, how to harden iron. Instead, the Bible says they had to go to the Philistines who knew how to harden iron to get what few iron implements they possessed sharpened. Unlike unhardened iron, bronze was not very strong. Therefore, the bronze swords of the time of Joshua had a unique shape. They were sickle-shaped. Go to the next slide of the PowerPoint presentation. This slide shows an example of what I mean. On the left side, I have quoted the same passage, Joshua 6.21, from two translations, the NRSV and the NIV. You can see that the NRSV holds more carefully to the original meaning than does the NIV. Well, what does edge of the sword mean then? The picture on the right depicts an Egyptian official striking a victim with a sickle sword or the edge of the sword. His sword, sharpened on the outside, and frequently found enhanced with pieces of flint, was a lopping sword as opposed to a stabbing, straight-edged sword. The sickle sword was used for removing limbs and heads as depicted here. It wasn't until straight-edged swords were commonly made from hardened iron in the late 11th century BC that they were used as stabbing swords and carried in a sheath. Further, if sickle swords met resistance at the pointed end while in use, they would bend. Obviously, that made them unsuitable as a stabbing weapon. The next slide shows four more examples of sickle swords from the time when bronze weaponry dominated. Now equipped with this bit of archaeological knowledge, you have another clue as to when the book of Joshua was written. That is, the time when sickle swords were used, as noted by the expression, edge of the sword, or sometime before the 11th century B.C. Turn now to verse 30 of chapter 8. Verse 30 through 35 at the end of the chapter is very unusual and constitutes a paragraph, although most translations do not show it as a paragraph. This paragraph tells how the Israelites, immediately after their victory at Ai, traveled to a place called Mount Ebal to build an altar. To understand why this seems unusual, we should consult a map. So go to the next slide of the PowerPoint presentation that has a map showing the location of the cities we have discussed in this book so far. The Israelites started their campaign on the eastern side of the Jordan River, crossed over the river, and defeated Jericho. Next they went west into the hill country and defeated Ai. Both those cities fell following battles because the Canaanites staunchly defended their locations. <clears throat> now in verse 30, it seems the Israelites went peacefully to Mount Ebal to build an altar. To me, this seems most unusual. Not the fact that they were directed to build an altar, but they did not have to do battle to get there. Instead, in verse 33, it reports that the Israelites went to the region and stood, apparently tranquilly, with the local inhabitants and offered burnt and peace offerings. Look at the map and you'll see Mount Ebal is adjacent to the ancient city of Shechem. In fact, Mount Ebal is just north of Shechem, and another mountain, Mount Gerizim, is just south of the city. The next slide is a photograph that shows how Shechem is in the valley between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Today, Shechem is known as the modern city of Nablus. The odd situation of not having to do battle to enter a region does not happen anywhere else in the book of Joshua. Many scholars have puzzled over why the Israelites could have approached Shechem peacefully. 
several writers have concluded that there must have been an earlier link between the people of Israel and the inhabitants of Shechem. In the Bible, we find such a connection. Genesis 33, verses 18 to 20, records that Jacob settled in the vicinity of Shechem, bought some land, and erected an altar. In fact, there is an ancient well near Shechem that today is believed to have been a well constructed by Jacob. The next PowerPoint slide is a picture of that well, and it's the one that tradition holds as Jacob's well. <coughs> it can be seen today beneath a Greek, Greek Orthodox church. Another interesting archaeological finding was in Egypt, where letters written on clay tablets that are called the Amarna tablets have been found and now are translated. These letters are pieces of correspondence between kings who lived in Canaan and an Egyptian pharaoh during the exact time that the Israelites were entering the land. The next PowerPoint slide is a picture of one of those tablets. This particular letter is from the king of Shechem and is addressed to the pharaoh. The text implies that the king of Shechem was independent of the pharaoh. Letters from other Canaanite kings now tell us how the king of Shechem had become allied with some desert people who had recently appeared in the land. Many of us conclude that the desert people were none other than the Israelites, and the Amarna letters support the biblical account of how the Israelites militarily entered the land from Jordan, but, for some reason, were able to peacefully approach the Shechem area to conduct the ceremony as described in Joshua 8, verses 31 to 35. Those verses also inform us that Joshua went to Mount Ebal and Gerizim and to the city of Shechem to comply with Moses' directive in Deuteronomy 11, verse 21, and Deuteronomy 27. Moses had told the Israelites that after they were in the land, they were go to Mount Ebal's and Gerizim. There, they were to construct an altar on Ebal of, quote, unhewn stones on which no iron tool has been used, close quote, in conformity with God's directive in Exodus 20, 25. They were also to write the words of the law on stones covered with plaster. And finally, Joshua was to read the blessings and curses found in Deuteronomy 27 and 28 to the tribes. Half of the tribes he assembled on Mount Ebal and half on Mount Gerizim. Despite the mountain's height, Ebal is 3,083 feet or 940 meters high, <coughs> and Gerizim is 2,890 feet or 881 meters high, there are many contemporary accounts of people speaking from the slopes of the mountain and being heard in the valley below. Even with the noise of the busy, busy modern city of Nablus, I myself have been at the top of Gerizim and clearly heard the voices of children playing in the Balata refugee camp at Gerizim's base. By reading the blessings and curses as reported in Joshua 8, Joshua fulfilled Moses' command. Interestingly, archaeologists have uncovered finds that support the historicity of this event also. In 1980, archaeologist Adam Sertal excavated a worship site on the summit of Mount Ebal. A large stone altar and cultic complex was discovered, and underneath the large altar, a smaller circular altar of uncut stone, an altar that Sertal states of the 15th century was discovered. The next PowerPoint slide is a drawing of what those altars were like and a reconstruction of the one dating to the time of Joshua. Although there is some disagreement among archaeologists recording, uh, regarding the dating, Zertal is confident his conclusions are correct. Obviously, this is an intriguing parallel to the account in the Bible. The Israelites were also instructed to plaster stone and write the law on them. Ancient Shechem was excavated in the 1950s and 60s. The archaeological name for the site is Tel Balata. The next PowerPoint slide is an aerial view of the excavated site. Archaeologists found an unusually tall, broken stone monument in front of a building that could have been an ancient temple. Could this have been one of the plastered stones on which Joshua wrote the law? And there is another very interesting element to this story. It is Shechem's connection to the total revelation of God's promises. 
When Abram first entered the land, he arrived in the vicinity of Shechem, and there he was instructed by God to build an altar. There, too, Abram was promised that in him all the families of the earth were to be blessed. Jacob lived in Shechem, as we discussed earlier. And later in the Bible, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers not far from Shechem. <coughs> Shechem has a long history in the Bible. And what is even more important is that Jesus visited this very place. In the New Testament, this town is called Sychar. And here Jesus had a conversation with a woman at Jacob's well. It is recorded in John chapter 4. And in that conversation, Jesus revealed he was the Messiah. In other words, the blessing to all families of the earth promised earlier to Abram. These six verses tucked into the end of chapter 8 are brimming with meaning. Understanding Bible history, archaeology, and geography can make those verses come alive and reveal the deep messages given to the people of Israel. Shechem was woven throughout the biblical record, and the next PowerPoint slide shows some of that history. But in this chapter of Joshua, it is again revealed who God was by what he did. God cared for his people as he allowed them to peacefully gather at Shechem. God provided a worship site for them that had deep historical significance. <clears throat> God provided an ally in the Shechemites who would help the Israelites inherit the land promised centuries earlier at Shechem in Genesis 12. And for us in the New Testament at Shechem, Jesus, God's son, confirmed God's promise given in Genesis 12 that he would provide a savior for all nations. What a beautiful book we study. What a great and honorable God we serve.